I know that some time ago we went through the book of Revelation, and we also did a we also did an overview of Daniel. I know that when we did this, there were quite a number of people who are with us now who were not with us at the time. So I think we're going to go back through that process again. This time I will post the recordings to the other channel, to the Open Face channel. I think most of us, all of us, are very much aware that we are living in the last moments of time. There, there is a, a forum that I'm in, I am connected to on WhatsApp. And, um, you know, from time to time, people try to discuss the prophecies. And I, I just can't, I can't, I can't, I, 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 am, I am appalled at some of the interpretations. You know, there's one person who says that all of these prophecies were fulfilled from the time of Jesus. They don't, they, they have no more fulfillment. They were fulfilled 2,000 years ago. One person holds to that idea. Another person has to the, holds to the idea that they are all to be fulfilled in the future, that nothing has been fulfilled yet. So you have these extremes. And um, one thing that I recognize in monitoring these discussions is that the, the basic reason why there are so many confusing ideas is that people don't understand the background information to the prophecies. And what do I mean by this? You know that if you don't have, you know, if, if they, they talk about people having different worldviews, people having a different foundation, if, if both of us come to the same subject, and you have one foundation and I have another foundation and we're operating on that basis. All the evidence that one side presents means nothing to the other side because he's operating from a different foundation. And so everything he's seeing, he's viewing it in a different way. It's like, it's like when Jesus came to this, this earth, the Jews had a perspective of a, a, an earthly kingdom uh, a messiah who would deliver them physically from physical enemies and from, from, from physical difficulties. And Jesus never, absolutely never fit that description. So even though Jesus could take the prophecies and the disciples could take the prophecies about him and they could explain them from the Bible, you could never convince the Jews because they had their background perspective on the prophecies was basically 180 degrees different from what Jesus and the disciples were trying to show them. So even though the evidence was overwhelming that this man was special, you know, even a blind man could say, since the world began, we have never heard of anybody who could open the eyes of somebody who was born blind. If this man was not of God, he could do nothing. Even in the face of such irrefutable logic, they re rejected what they saw because their background perspective was different. So I'm saying all of this to say that as we go to the books of Daniel and Revelation, what I want to do, what I want to emphasize is the background information, the, the, the perspective that we're going to be, be operating from. Because if we don't see the background picture, if we don't have a, what I would refer to as a macro view, if we don't step back, if we're not able to zoom out in everything that, that, that I, I know in life, if you can zoom out, no matter what it is, you, be, you begin to understand better. You know, and it's, it's a cliche, it's a well-known phrase. You can't see the forest because you're looking at the trees. Zoom out, get up high and look down and see what is happening and you can begin to fit the pieces together. So. In our study of Daniel and Revelation, that's where we want to, that's how we want to operate. And um, I would say we even need to go further than what we can find in the books of Daniel and Revelation. And we need to go beyond, right back to the beginning to see if we can understand what ultimately is the competition or the contest between God and Satan. What is it about? 
We know that this did not start in the time of Daniel. It did not start in the time of John the Revelator. The whole contest began even before this world was created. And Daniel and Revelation is only showing us the ultimate conclusion. Daniel and Revelation, especially when it culminates in the book of Revelation, it takes us to the end of the story. Revelation is the end of the story. It's the end of the great controversy. It's the end of Satan. It's the end of sin. It's, it's the end of sickness and sadness and disease and death. It takes us to the end of the story. To understand how the story ends, and to understand what needs to happen for the story to end, we need to understand how the story began and what are the issues involved in, in this story. What are the issues involved? So we, we could just take a, a brief moment and look at the pre-creation conflict before we even begin to look at the book of Daniel. Um, Brother Brian, your your mic is unmuted. I still don't know if you want to say something because I'm not hearing anything at all. If not, I'll go ahead and mute, unmute you because I usually can tell if somebody wants to say something by looking at the mic and your mic being open kind of throws me off a little bit. All right. So this this is the way we understand what we refer to as the great controversy. As a matter of fact, I'm going to, I'm going to bring up my Bible, regardless of whether or not uh, uh, we will use it right away, but I'm going to bring it up because I might want to scribble something and it's good to have the Bible there. I can use it to um, write if I have to. I can use the Bible screen here, my writing board. All right, so, Let me clean this up. Okay. The um what is clear to us, what is very clear to us is that there is something happening in the universe that is bigger than what is happening on planet Earth. The the we, we have tried to explain, we have tried to examine the issue that something is going on in this universe that has even restrained God's almighty power. I think we have proven that. We, even this morning we were discussing something is going on that restrains God from doing the things that he wants to do. There is a legal contest that is taking place. And I call it a legal contest because it involves, it, it involves principles that limits the way God works. So I'm calling it legal. That's what I mean by legal. I mean restraining elements. So God has to operate within a framework, and I call that framework the legal boundaries. Now, what happened in the beginning? Let me, let me begin with the most basic question that people ask. They say, if, if God knows everything, and God knew that if he created the, the, the universe, if he created Lucifer, he knew beforehand because we teach that God is able to see the future. So God knew beforehand that when he created Lucifer, he would become Satan. And he knew that when he became Satan, this world would fall into sin. And he knew that when this world fell into sin, billions and billions of people would perish. He knew that there would be terrific suffering and pain and disease and death and the worst evils that the universe has ever seen. He knew it would take place on this planet. And people like to think in this way. They say, if I were God, I would just not create Satan. I would not create Lucifer. And if I were God, I would just maybe not create this planet then. Even if I created Lucifer, why, why create this planet? Or, or why create the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and expose Adam and Eve to temptation? Now I'm going to I'm going to explain my understanding of this. And some of this is a bit of reasoning, let me admit. Some of it is a bit of reasoning, but it is reasoning based on things that are revealed in the Bible and things that are fairly obvious. And here's what it is. All right. First thing we know. First thing we know is that God never 
created evil. God never created evil. God only created good. Even though there is a verse in Isaiah that where God says, I create the evil and I create the good. There is a verse in the Bible that says this. And as a matter of fact, maybe I should even 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 bring up the verse. Maybe I should show the verse because I mean people like to see and not just to hear. And that's a good thing, right? It's Isaiah 45 and verse 7. And here God says, um, I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, Yahweh, Jehovah, Yahuwah, however you want to pronounce it, I, the Lord, do all these things. So God himself makes a claim here that he's the one who creates evil it's actually in the bible and of course this is an illustration of the fact that when we read the bible we must under we must approach it we must look at things in context god is not saying that i created evil god means if you look at the the, the context of what is being said in isaiah not just in this chapter but the, the entire section of isaiah what god is talking about is that he is able to to he's able to bring evil circumstances upon Israel and upon any nation, and he's also able to bring positive circumstances upon any nation. Those who serve him, those who live according to his will, good will come upon them, peace will come upon them. Those who live contrary to his will, evil will come upon them. You understand? God is not talking about evil in the sense of of iniquity god is talking about evil in the sense of what we call evil circumstances like when e egypt was destroyed it says in the psalms that god sent evil angels among them literally it means god sent messengers who brought evil circumstances upon them you know so god is not saying that he designed and created evil as a matter of fact, if you look at the, 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 the version on the right hand side, the NASB, it says that God creates calamity, not evil. So, just to look at the verse a little bit more, look at the left hand side. God says, I form the light and I create darkness. Okay. There are some people who don't like to, to mention the word science because science is so misused. And has become a tool of evil but there are certain things that um you know true science is just true and one thing we, we, we science has been able to discover is that darkness is nothing darkness is nothing they, they, you have no nobody can can tell us what darkness is made up of what we can what we can say is what light is made up of Light is made up of little pulses of energy. Exactly how to define it, man has not been able to do it, but they have been able to discover that light has certain, it has, it has certain definite properties. It's made up of pulses of energy. Light can be bent. Light can be reflect, refracted. You can, you, can, you can experiment with light. It's something that is substantial. Darkness is nothing. What is darkness? And I, I have asked, this question and and it always is the same answer i ask somebody can you define darkness without using the word light and it can't be done because darkness to define something to define something on its own is to is is is, is it has to have substance it has to have some kind of meaning but darkness is only defined in relationship to light Darkness is the absence of light. It is not something. It's not something in itself. It's the absence of something, and we, this goes for several other things, like cold, for example. Cold is not something. It's the absence of heat. In the same way, evil is not something in itself. Evil is the absence of something. Evil is the absence of goodness. So God never created, God never created evil. 
But from the moment that God existed, from the moment that God existed, from the moment that good existed, good is only good because evil is possible. Good is only good because evil is possible. If you talk about good and there's no possibility of evil, good means nothing. So what I mean is that once God, once good existed, you have to have the possibility of evil. Otherwise, you are talking about meaningless terms. So all that had to happen for evil to be potentially possible is for good to arrive. Good is something. And so because there's good, potentially, there can be evil. So God never created evil. What God did was create good. God created everything good. Now, here's the thing. God could have simply lived alone for all eternity. Well, he, well, of course, he could have lived with his son, right? Jesus, the, the son of God, having been begotten of the father, is the same nature of, as his father. He is good in himself. He's good by nature. There's no darkness at all in God, as it says in the book of John. God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So in God and in Jesus, there's no darkness and there's no possibility of darkness because they are the definition of good. They are the definition of light. There's no possibility of darkness or of evil in God and his son. But the moment God decides to create lesser beings, the moment God decides to populate the universe and to make them free, to make them free, that means they are free to choose. They have the potential to choose to, to serve God and they have the potential to so choose something else. As long as you make, make them free, there is a possibility that one, way, one day, somehow, some way, one of these free beings might choose to reject the way of light, may choose to reject the way of good, now, somebody may say, that's not likely. All right, fair enough. What if the universe lasts for a million years? What if it lasts for a billion years? As long as you make free people, free beings, somewhere, sometime, there is the possibility that one of them may come along and think, what if I take this course? Nobody knows what evil is. It has never been seen. It has never arisen because everything is good. Nobody knows what darkness is. When it occurs to somebody's mind, because we are inventive, we, we creatures, we are inventive, we intelligent beings, we are inventive, we like to think and to reason. When the question arises, what happens if I take this direction? Nobody knows. It has never been seen before. The only person who knows where this will end up is God. What does God do? Now, there are two things that are before God, and I will, I will, I, I, it's kind of obvious, right? The first thing that God can do is, and I'm going to, I'm going to scribble it on the screen again. I'm going to scribble it on the screen. The first thing that God can do is abandon creating any, anybody. That's one thing. Secondly, it can make us all without free will. All right, those are two things. You have the option of making all, all created beings, intelligent beings. And if we are made without free will, we will never sin. We will never rebel against god we will never the only thing we will say as long as we exist is father i love you how much does it mean when somebody says i love you just because they are parents just because they can't say anything else how much does that mean i like to tell the story that my father told me I, I, it's a brutal and and bad story but still it, it illustrates what i'm trying to say my father told me of um I don't know if he saw it or he heard the story. 
of a man who was beating his wife somewhere in Jamaica here. And, you know, every time he hit her, he said, I told you to love me. Didn't I tell you to love me? Bang. And every time he would hit the lady, she says, I love you. I love you. Now, you know that somebody who does this is extremely sick. And somebody who is satisfied for somebody to be saying, I love you. To be using the words when you know that in the person's heart, it is not true. This person is sick. That cannot satisfy anybody who has any kind of any kind of intelligence and 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 and, and who is seeking for something meaningful. No. This is a sick person. It's like having a doll. And the doll is said, I love you. You press a button. I love you. I love you. It's like this. How much can that satisfy anybody? When my wife says, I love you. We're, not, we're both her and myself. We are not very expressive people. We don't say things like that very often. But when it happens, it's meaningful. Maybe because it's not said every day. And you know that when it's said, it's something that is coming from the heart and from the experience. So when 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 somebody just says something. When, when we serve God because we are robots, that's what it is. God makes us as robots. This could never satisfy the heart of God Almighty. What you have in you, that desire for reality, that desire for meaningfulness, that's why God created us. That's why, that's why when, when my, my grandson comes and says, Grandpa, and he wants to show me something or do something, when he voluntarily comes to me, I am pleased because he's beginning to enjoy grandpa's company. He could be somewhere else, but he enjoys my company. It means a lot to me. God would not create robots. He wanted beings that could be, in terms of freedom, they would be his counterpart. In terms of freedom, they would be his counterpart. I can tell you that, um, you know, even. I saw a movie once, many years ago, of a, of a king who married a common person. And, um, you know, she, she, she never cared for the fact that he was a king. And she stood up to him and, and, and resisted him and defied him, you know, in the process. And eventually they, 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 they got married and he learned to respect her. And um, when he was getting married before the crowd and before everybody, he said, she is my equal in every way. Now, you, I, I mentioned this because there are many, especially in Bible times and maybe in some countries, there are many people who are able to have several wives. I don't know how, how Solomon managed with his 700 wives and 300 concubines, but I can guarantee you, most of them never meant anything to him other than that they were political figures or they were good for a one night stand. Sorry to, be, to use that, that loose term, but you understand what I mean. He could never have meaningful relationships with them. And, and what makes marriage meaningful, what makes that kind of relationship meaningful is because you care personally for the person. You have a relationship. It's not just a matter of a, 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 a brief interaction. Now, all of those wives of Solomon might have, might have, might have hung around Solomon. They stayed there because they were, they were compelled to and maybe because the prestige associated with it. But how many of them loved him? I don't know, but I doubt that every one of them loved him the way a wife should love a husband. Now, God was not creating a universe like this because that does not satisfy the heart of somebody who has true, the true motives of goodness and who is looking for something real. So God could not have made us without free will. What about the alternative? Don't create anybody. God and Jesus alone live forever. That's the alternative. And if you were God Almighty, I mean, I'm sorry, nobody can be God Almighty. Nobody can be God except God. But if you just think about it for a moment, that could never, that could not satisfy God either. They say, they say God is. God is self-sufficient. God doesn't need anybody. I don't think I fully believe this, okay? 
What I mean is that even though he is God, it makes God more happy to have to have us in a relationship with him. I believe God is made more happy. Although God is God Almighty, it's kind of ridiculous to say God cannot be made happy in any way. That doesn't make sense. That's turning God into a machine. God is a person with a personality. There are things that makes God happy. And one of them is that he's able to interact with, with his children. He's able to have children who can love him in return and who can voluntarily and freely speak of his goodness and his love. It pleases God. It pleases even the almighty God. And so I think when God thought about it, God realized that he had the option of living alone for all eternity with his son, with Jesus, all right? Or he could go ahead and populate the universe. He could populate the universe with free beings with the possibility that sometime, somewhere, somebody, might experiment with the alternative side of the universe, the side of evil. We might say God took a risk. And of course, it's hard to use that phrase because we know that God knows everything. But in a sense, God took a risk. When God decided to create free beings, he took a risk. He took the, 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 he took the risk that one day somebody would turn against him. And when that person did, it would take a terrible conflict to settle the question, to, 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 to heal the wounds, to answer the questions, and to settle the situation forever. So if you if you were God, you sat down and you think about it, you think about it, and you think, should I remain alone forever? Will it be worth it? All the pain and the suffering and the trauma that the universe will go through. Brother David. It, but David, he did not take a risk. He did not take a risk because he knew everything. He did not take a risk. He's not a gambler anyway. I, 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 that's what I tried to say, brother Sam. But I use the phrase because I want people to understand the option. I, I, I know, I know what you can get to. I'm just saying the terminology is that he didn't take a risk. Also, he with his son. His son was not Jesus. His son was named Michael. I know we always say that when we say that. Not those people. Well, he said, he used to throw me off until I know better. That's Michael that he had, that was with them back there in the, you know, in the eternity past. That was him and Michael together. Okay. That's all right. All right. Yes, Brother Sam. Um, yes. Yeah, so that was the situation that existed. And this is why God went ahead and created the universe and created free beings. And it was this freedom that he gave us, this free will. This is the root of what has been happening. Uh, this is the root of all evil that exists. You know, people, people, people ask the question, why, why didn't God do this? Why doesn't God do this? Why doesn't God interfere? Those same people value the freedom to choose. They value their free will and they would never give it up. Those same people use their free will to reject God, they use that freedom and they choose not to serve God. They, they, they rail against God, but the same free will that allows you to choose to reject God is the same free will that God that, that allows. It's the same free will that God has to respect. Now that you have chosen to reject God, now that you have chosen to serve Satan, now that you have chosen to remain with the first Adam, you have put yourself in territory where God is not free to interfere in your life. That's the point that is important for people to understand. The same freedom of will that allows you to reject God is the same freedom that allows you to put yourself in a place where God has to respect your freedom. God has to respect where you are and not intervene in your life even when disasters come upon you that's the thing people want want they, they want the freedom to say i will serve whom i will but when i get into trouble god must intervene i will serve whom i will but when my children or my family or when disaster is coming god should intervene because he's god almighty they say no 
God is operating on the principles of fair play and justice. And in this story, Satan has rights. When people, when a human race made a choice to put itself on the side of Satan, the entire race fell into that position. Women, children, men, even the trees and, and, and the, 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 the topography of the, of the earth came under that dominion of Satan. And God, if God does not respect this, then what's the point? What's the point? Why did he put the fruit in the garden? Why did he give man the choice if he's not going to respect man's choice? So man made a choice and God respects it. And because he's love and because he, he prepared for this emergency, he made a way for us to escape Satan's dominion. He made a way for us to escape it. And so it's a question of will you accept my way of escape? And if you accept my way of escape, you open the door for me to begin to work in your life, to protect you, to keep you, to build you up to make you into what I want you to be. And if you don't accept the salvation that is there, you remain where you were. You remain in the enemy's territory. You live by chance. Your life hangs by a thread like the, thread, like the life of a dog or a goat or a cow because you have not allowed God the right to intervene in your circumstances. This is the basic story. This is the basic story. You, we can get into details and you can you can find that there are nuances to it, but this is a basic story. It's the basic answer to why there is so much suffering and evil taking place in the world. Now, the book of Revelation takes us to the end of the story, how God is going to finish the story. And as I tried to point out this morning, there are two, two aspects to the story. There are two aspects. Number one, Number one is that there was a question of God's character. And number two, there is a question of God's government. I think it's important that we understand that this, this, is, like, this is like the very basic foundation of it's, it's a it's it's a, it's a, it's a it's the underlying foundation for the entire study of the Bible, but in particular of the books of Daniel and Revelation. These two issues, God's character and God's government, that is what the, 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 these books are about. Now, as we pointed out this morning, when it comes to the vindication of God's character, let me put in the word vindication. All right, when it comes to the vindication of God's character, we know that Jesus has done this in a way that is unmistakable. I can give you verse upon verse upon verse that demonstrates this. I can just reel them out from the top of my head. Um, let me just quickly express a few of these verses that talk about what Jesus did in vindicating God's character. Um, in John 17, verse 3, Jesus says, I have glorified you on the earth. It's, it's not verse 3, it's about verse 6 or verse 5. Verse 4, I have glorified thee on the earth. I have finished the work which you, thou gavest me to, thee, to do. I have manifested thy name. I have revealed your character unto the men which thou gavest me out of the world. The book of John especially is full of it. John 1 verse 18. No man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son which is in the bosom of the father, he has declared him. Over and over, many verses. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Over and over, it's all over the Bible. I could go on for a very long time if I keep doing this. So what the point I'm making is that God's character has been vindicated by Jesus. You, you could say that this is mission accomplished, all right? 
Now, the problem is that there are many Christians who believe that this is the only issue. So they say everything was finished at the cross. They don't even bother to go on to the resurrection, which is equally important. But this is not the only issue. This was the first part of Lucifer's assault against God. He accused, he accused God. I mean, just to just think about it uh, for a moment and remember that in the beginning, Lucifer was a good angel. He was he was filled with the spirit of God. He did not just get up one night and start attacking God and start making insinuations and telling lies about God. He didn't start this way. Even though Jesus says he was a liar from the beginning, he was a murderer and a liar from the beginning. He didn't start out like this because things don't just change like this. I don't think Lucifer got up one day and said, I'm going to be wicked today. No. The first thing he did was he began to look at himself and to think he knew better than God. He began to, he, the first blasphemous thing he did was outwardly not so terrible. He just thought he could improve on what God said or on what God did. I'm sure he just set out basically to do things better than how, how, how God said to do it. And he Brother kept meeting David. up on. Is Brother Tony? Can I ask you a question? Sure, Brother Tony. Okay, when Jesus says that he was a liar from the beginning, in retrospect, what does that really mean? From um, from when he was created, it was in his heart to do evil. Well, well, I would say obviously it couldn't have been brother brother Tony because God made him good. So I would look at this beginning in the same context where it says in Genesis one: in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. I, I think Jesus means from the beginning of his rebellion. It couldn't be from the beginning when he was created, but when Jesus says he was a liar from the beginning, I understand him to mean he was a liar from the moment his creation, his, his rebellion started. In, in him, in that moment of rebellion, even though it did not look to be so bad, but the seed was in him at that moment of murder and lies. In other words, what I mean is, we know that when a person rejects the spirit of God, they may not appear to be too evil at the start, but everything is in them at that moment because outside of God, there is no light. Once you step away from God, you're a murderer and a liar from the very start of that experience, even though it may not appear at that moment. Yes, Sister Anita, you can go ahead. Um, um, regarding to what you said um, in the beginning, that God knew what this world um, would become even before he created it. Wouldn't you say um, that was one of the reasons why Jesus said um, Satan um, was a liar from, um, from the beginning? Because um, he knew, Jesus and his father knew what would happen, what Satan would do, as you said earlier before God even created this planet. I, 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 I would be reluctant to, uh, to uh, accept that, Sister Manita. Let me explain why. Let me okay. explain why. All right, and I'll, I'll mute you because your, your mic is noisy. But the, if, if God knows that Lucifer is going to be evil and then he says he was a liar from the beginning, remember that if, if the beginning means the moment God created him, and from the moment God creates him, God says, you're a liar and a murderer. That's what you are. And God just created this person. Then who is going to be blamed for the fact that he's a liar and a murderer? Who is going to be blamed? You have to say God created him a liar and a murderer. If we say God's foreknowledge means that he was this from the beginning. God's foreknowledge does not cause something to be. It simply is aware of the course that this person is going to take. Lucifer in the beginning was good because everything that God made was very good, including Lucifer. But it shows you that what you are does not guarantee what you will become. What you are does not guarantee what you will become. We have free choice, so what we become is according to our choice and the direction we take in life. We can be good and end up evil, or we can be evil and end up good. I mean, 
only God is good, but I mean, depending on the choices that we make. So I think that, I don't think that we, from the beginning of creation, Lucifer was evil, no. I think he was good, but because he had freedom and every one of us had freedom, God understood the danger of freedom and that danger materialized in Lucifer, Lucifer's case. And I think if Lucifer hadn't, 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 hadn't become evil and we didn't see sin somewhere in the days of eternity, it probably would arise. Somebody would experiment and would ar it would arise. Somebody would begin to think along that line. Might even have been me, God forbid. But I mean, somebody with free will might think along that line because we had never seen the other side. So the best way is to let it come, let it happen, deal with it. And I hate to use the term, but it's, it, it, it serves the purpose well. And to inoculate the universe to inoculate the universe against it. When you have it once, it gives you the antibodies and you will never have it again. That's what God did, did with sin. And we are in the process now of the, the antibodies being made. So. Thank you, thank you. Okay, Sister Anita. Brother David, you know, I was just, uh, I think it was, you know, this whole question about Michael's on the bus, some people were discussing Michael and who he was, and so. But anyway, I didn't want to get into that discussion because I didn't. I wasn't fully. I mean, I believe that he was Christ, but I couldn't put it in the text. But in your, your uh, information, it, it said that. Um, I think it was your information. It said that um, there was only one archangel, and that was Michael. There wasn't uh, two or four archangels. And exactly. What what is were you right or wrong, or did you change your mind or what? I didn't change my mind. I believe there's only one archangel, Sister Bobby. Okay. All right. Yeah. That's all I was concerned about. No, no. I, I I will never say that because that's not what I believe. I know that in the book of Enoch it says there are seven of them. There's Michael. There's Gabriel. There's Raphael. There's a few of them. That's in the book of Enoch, and I don't believe the book of Enoch. Is the genuine book of Enoch? I think it's 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 a uh, it's it's a forgery. Those that are around people put their trust in it, but there are very there there are some fanciful things in it that I don't accept at all. And it talks about seven archangels, but the word arc arch means the chief. And G, there's only one chief over the angels, and it's Jesus Christ, not several of them. All right. And I'm so going to go ahead. Yes, what, what about so? What was Lucifer then? Lucifer was was uh, 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 he was one of the the leaders of the angels. He was not the chief angel. He was not the, he was not the ruler over the angels. There 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 is Lucifer. There was there was Gabriel, and they are commanding angels. But there's only one archangel. And when the Lord descends from heaven, it will be with the voice of not an archangel, but the archangel. Okay, let's get to the sanctuary then. I, I've been taught wrong. I always taught there was two archangels at wrong. the throne of God. So there was only one there? No, there are two covering cherubs. There are two covering cherubs, but they are not archangels. I think oh, the word okay, I got I see what you're talking about. Now okay, arc me, you arc me chief, and that's gonna be Michael. Okay, I got you. Okay, brother, brother. So, yes, sister Esther, go ahead. Oh, uh, that that was exactly my question about the Covering chair. <laughs> Thank you for the answer. Okay. David, I want to clarify something. Yes, Brother Ray. Yeah, I was on my other computer and it just took a took a crash. Um we have been taught um through uh you know through our religious um beliefs or family that um uh Lucifer was jealous of Jesus and um that's not in the Bible. The Bible talks about that. He started glorifying himself. That's that's number one, because Jesus and Jesus created Lucifer. It wasn't the Father. It was Jesus. So Satan was the first angel ever created. So he was the angel of light. And so um, I just wanted to bring that up to see if I'm correct or wrong. Because Lucifer, it wasn't because of Jesus that he was jealous. It was because of himself. He looked at himself. And and he he wanted that adoration. He wanted that, you know, 
that glory for himself. And I think this is what brought him, brought him down. Um, what I'm going to say, Brother Ray, is that the, the details about Jesus, about, about Lucifer being jealous of the Son of God, it's not in the Bible. Those details are not there, okay? What, what, as you pointed out in Ezekiel um, 28, it talks about him. He was, he was perfect until the day iniquity was found in him. And um, in, in Isaiah 14, it says that he says, I will be like the most high. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Where I am concerned for myself privately, not what I'm going to teach, but for myself, I do believe it is likely that he developed resentment against Jesus. Okay, against Michael then, to, 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 so Brother Sam doesn't correct me. Uh, against Michael. Uh, uh, it, it sounds plausible to me that because he saw that there was somebody who had the inside with God, somebody who was elevated above him, this led to him seeking that same kind of position. In seeking glory for himself, it was in contrast to Jesus Christ. Because to be honest, Neither you nor I believe that he could dare to crave the father's position, literally. Lucifer could never believe that he could overthrow God or that he could become the, the, the great creator of the universe. Lucifer knows he doesn't have this power, but he was in some way rebelling against God. And it's likely that it was in, in the sense that he was, he was envious of the position of somebody else. So I'm saying I'm not throwing this out at all. But I'm not going to teach it because I don't see it clearly outlined in the Bible. David? So, yes, it's, that's what I say. Uh, yeah, I heard that from other people too, that the two uh, angels or covering cherubs represented Satan or Lucifer and Michael. And um, I think it's a very dangerous and false belief. Uh, I don't know where does it come from, but I just want... The brethren to think about it. Uh, Dave, um, Michael never was on the same level as Lucifer in heaven. Never, he never covered um, God as Lucifer did. Yes, it, it, the, the Mormons teach that they were they were they were brothers. I think they they it's kind of like twin brothers, you know. So it's it's not a Christian teaching. And it's not something that is in the Bible. There's only one begotten Son of God, and He is not on any equality with any other angel, you know. But anyway, so to, to get back to the the, the 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 point of the study, Jesus settled that attack against God's character. One one of the things that we saw that it's it's brought out in the Bible is that Lucifer try to point out that God was, his motives towards his creation were impure. And this comes out best of all, when you see him lying about Job, when you see him trying to slander God, uh, Job's, Job's motives in serving God, when you see him trying to slander God when he comes to Adam and Eve. Now, going strictly by the Bible, these are the places where you can find out what is he saying about God. So he says to Adam and Eve, did God say? What is he saying? He's saying God is a liar. God is not telling you the truth. God knows. Not only is God a liar, but God is a, a, a he has he has bad motives behind his lies. God told you a lie that you would die, and the reason God did it was because God is holding you back from being like Himself. And this also gives us some insight into the fact that Lucifer was disturbed because he himself was not granted that privilege. What he is upset about, what he wanted, he comes to Adam and Eve and says, this is what God is holding you back from. So even though the Bible may not come out straight and tell you exactly the details of his rebellion, you can find clues in the Bible, in the stories that the Bible tells us. So his purpose was to lie about God. Jesus came here. I love. I love the revelation of Jesus more than I love anything in the Bible. When I, when I came to understand this message of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ, my relationship with God changed. I got to see God like I never did before. 
I, 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 I stopped being afraid of God. I stopped being afraid to be comfortable with God. Everything changed. I learned to relax around God. I learned to understand how much God loved me because I saw his glory in the face of Jesus Christ. And, and Jesus took away this lying mask that Satan put over the face of God. But the thing is, brothers and sisters, the story is not finished because there is something else. Lucifer set up an alternative government. What he came to this planet to do, let us try to understand what Lucifer came to this planet to do, what, what he was permitted to do. If he could persuade the people here, if he could persuade them to allow him to take control of this government, if he could persuade them, of this kingdom he would set up a kingdom based on his principles this is the point this is what is going on in this planet there are two kinds of principles of government the first government says look you cannot live without god you cannot do anything good without god you cannot be happy without god you cannot live in a harmonious you cannot achieve real meaning in life unless god lives in you the basis of God's government is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's God's government. What is the basis of Satan's government? The basis of Satan's government is the glory of self. It's that self becomes governor. And when self is governor, how do you control the system? You put men in control of men. You put created beings in control of created beings, and they bend and they coerce and they compel others to come into to come into line with the government and this is the way satan intends to create his utopia by compelling people by forcing people to conform to the system that a few people decide is best god's system is different god says there's only one thing that i need one thing that i need i need your heart and if I get your heart, I will create the greatest people that the universe has ever seen. God says this. And these two governments are in contention. That is what is happening. Now we know what God's character is like. But do we know if God's system of government works? Can it work? Can it work for a people who have been under Satan's governance? Can it work? This is what Daniel and Revelation are about. Daniel and Revelation are the final culmination where the kingdom of God, the kingdom of Jesus Christ, is revealed to be the only system that is fit to govern forever and ever and ever. This is what Daniel and Revelation is about. It's the vindication of the government of God. And that is why the story is not over yet, brothers and sisters. It's not finished. The story was not finished when Jesus died on the cross. That was phase one. Phase one is the vindication of God's character. Phase two is the vindication of God's government. And this is what we are involved in. This is why you and I have a part in the story. This is why it is so important, not for our salvation, but for the glory of our Father and for the establishment of the kingdom of our Lord. It is for their sake that we need to be involved and that we need to stand up for our God in the right way. The world and the universe is to see that God's government is the, uh, 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 the government of God in Jesus Christ is the only kingdom that is qualified to rule forever and ever and ever because it produces good. Amen. Hallelujah. Indeed. Indeed. So, this is what this is the background to the books of daniel and the revelation this is the background this is the underlying story that we are to keep in mind as we go to the study of these two books and if we keep this in mind it gives us a basis for understanding what is going on in these books much better one of the things that um you know i know this is that uh, th th this 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 chat group I was in where somebody was saying that, um, you know, all of these prophecies are fulfilled already from the time of Jesus. This is this th th these kinds of conclusions are, are arrived at because there are people who don't have a clue what is happening. They have no idea of the background information. They don't know what is going on in the background. What is the purpose of these books? Was God just telling the Jews a story about their history? No, there's something greater and bigger. And when you understand this bigger story, my goodness, 
we, we see value in our existence. There, there is a noble purpose that we are living for. I'm not just living to go to, to a nine to five and to scrape out a living till I die, till I go back to the dust. No, I'm in the universe for the glory. For, 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 I'm in a battle that involves the universe and that involves eternity and the destiny of the kingdom of my God is something that I am involved in. It makes our lives and our, 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 our existence, our ministry worthwhile, brothers and sisters. So this is the background to um this is the background to the books of Daniel and Revelation. And I I, I had it in mind to start to look at Daniel this afternoon, but I noticed that we have we have we have already covered one hour. And it doesn't make sense to start with a study this evening. So I think with this introduction, I'm going to stop here for this evening. And um, what I will do instead is take questions or comments. But I think if we can get this background information and hold on to it, we are prepared for the other chapters that we'll be looking at in subsequent weeks. So before, before we, we close off, let me ask us to go ahead and if we have any questions or any comments, now would be the time. David, I find a little bit of a challenge to accept or to believe that uh, Lucifer could at any time think that he could be equal with Jesus, knowing that Jesus created all things, including him. He didn't believe that. Uh, he didn't believe that. My he, didn't, he didn't believe that. That's why he told that. Okay, he not, didn't believe that. Um, but where well, you get that from, Brother Sam? Okay. Um, uh, what, what, we, what, what I would say is. Yeah, Sister White. Sister White. Well, I would say, oh, Sister White. Oh, that's, that's a different story. We're talking yeah, about. Yeah, oh. Let's not go off on a tangent, please. Okay. Let's not. Brother, Brother Sam, you're entitled to believe it, and the others are entitled to look for something more solid that's our personal view don't let's get off on a tangent here but um what i would say brother brother Ian, is that um you don't have to when 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 it says in isaiah when when it says of lucifer that was said in thine heart i will be like the most high okay this is the bible so so it says he, he says i will be like the most high now we understand that it means he wanted to be like the Most High in a limited way, in a certain aspect. There are people who want to be like God even on this earth, and it doesn't yes, mean that they, they, it doesn't mean they think they can be the Creator. So I think when he when if we say he was jealous of Michael, if we say he was jealous of Michael. You don't have to believe that you have the same ability as a person to be jealous of the person. There are people who are totally disqualified for a certain position. But they, they, they yearn for the glory and for the praise and the adoration that come with the position, even though they are not qualified for the position. So I think we can look at, at, at Luther and say he, he, he craved the admiration and the praise and the glory that went with Jesus' position as a commander of heaven. And he wished that he, I mean, if you look at yourself long enough, you look handsome, even if you are the ugliest thing on earth. If you look at yourself long enough, your little puny muscles begin to look sizable because you look at them long enough. So, so Lucifer's problem, I believe, was that he became absorbed in himself and he lost the perspective of how things really were. Yeah, I agree with that. I just thought that, you know, some of the arguments I put forth that um, Lucifer believed that he was equal with Jesus and, you know, God has to let him know that looking at equal with Jesus, Jesus is my son. Um, I, I, I think I can understand him wanting to get the glory that God had because he said he wants to be like the most high. So right. he's trying to set up something similar. And so he's rebelling against whatever the jealousy or envy or wherever it came from, how it came in him. He wants to be like God. But I, I, um, I don't think in his mind there was any question of whether or not he knew that Jesus was his creator or that Jesus was his son of God. The most the high God, God, not Jesus. Son of God, but at least he knew he was his creator. Isn't the most high the father? 
It's not Jesus. He wanted to be like the most high. That means the one that's above Jesus. That's what the Bible teaches. Well, the name Michael means he who is like the most high. So if you were to take it in that sense. Yes. Uh, yeah, like the most high, but the most high, we all understand that it is um, the father. It's not Jesus because if Lucifer wanted to be as the most high, it means they wanted to be above Jesus, more powerful than him. So, 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 so that verse, Brother Ray, that verse, I agree, is referring to his his ambition to be like the father i'm not i'm not contradicting that at all but the thing is in the old testament i will i will say this in the old testament there's not a lot there is not a lot of information about the son of god everything that happens in the old testament is focused on god as a single individual you don't find you don't find many references or inferences that god has a son so you will find that in the Old Testament, everything is related to God the Father, God the Most High. Even verses sometimes in the Old Testament that are referring to Jesus, you can find that the New Testament writers apply them to Jesus. If you look at them in the Old Testament, they actually are referring to Jehovah, to the Father. It seems that way. Because that is the Old Testament revelation. But what I'm saying is, we don't need to get hung up on the details. Okay, what I mean is, what does it matter if Lucifer wanted to be like Jesus? michael or he wanted to be like god the father the, the the point the point is that he rebelled against the government of god i believe that in god's system of government michael was a chief of the angels michael was a chief of the angels so it stands to reason that if lucifer is not the chief of the angels if he if he wants to be like god he first of all has to has, has to pass through michael's position it's a little bit of reasoning, and I'm saying we don't need to get hung up on it because it's not important to what we are saying. It's a technicality that we could argue about till the end of, of the world, and some people will quote Ellen White, and we can look at little, little details in the Bible, but it really doesn't matter to the, the bottom line of the story, which is that Lucifer rebelled against God's system of government. That's the bottom line. Brother Tony, go ahead. Um, okay. Jesus says no one takes his life. He laid his life down for us. So in actuality, Satan didn't really kill Jesus, did he? I, I, it, it depends on what, what, what we, we, we mean, brother, brother Tony. Jesus, Jesus didn't kill himself. He didn't commit suicide. But he went, in a sense, you could say he committed suicide because he went to the place of death. He deliberately went. When the disciples told him, don't go, he said, I'm going. So he deliberately went knowing that he was going to die. So in this sense, you could say he committed suicide. But who was it that hung him on the cross? Who was it that put him in a situation where his, his, his blood ran down like water? Who was it that put him in a place where he, he 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 physically lost his life and um when he says no man is taking it from me i lay it down of myself what he means is that nobody can put me in that position i have to do this myself nobody can put me in that position even god the father never put jesus there jesus had to do it voluntarily willingly so we, again it's another case of we could get caught up in the details and miss the point yeah but wasn't um wasn't they surprised that he was dead yeah they were surprised that he died so because soon. he died he, he died earlier than um than they expected you know they expected him to die right. but they didn't expect him to die so soon so it was a combination of things i mean he actually died it took him three hours to die but then you would ask the question if he had not been beaten and if he had not been made to hang on the cross would he have died? You know, so he died of a broken heart. He died when I he mean, couldn't find his father. He couldn't find his father. That killed him. He was the father was not there. Father been with him all his life. And now he can't find the father. And that killed him. I, I know that Satan instigated his death, but I mean, you know. 
I'm just saying, you know, from what the because he he was doesn't Bible say that he was born for this to die for us? Yeah, he, he himself says so. Um, look look at this verse. Okay, let me show you a verse here, right? Because sometimes, I mean, we we can we can reason, and some of our reasoning is correct, but um, sometimes. A little bit of nitpicking, maybe. Look at what the Bible says in in Acts two and verse twenty three. This is the, this is Peter. Him him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. This seems to say that God killed him. Look at what the next part. You have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain. The word slain means you've killed him. Yeah, right. So the the Bible says that they killed him. They slew him. But it was right, by the right. it was by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God. God knew he was going to die. God sent him to die. God God deliberately arranged things in such a way that he could be put in the place of death. But that does not eliminate the fact that those who actually carried out the action are accountable. They are responsible. They did the deed. It's it's like saying that it's like saying that the 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 the, the prime minister makes a decree or the the king makes a decree. That you are to be killed so they, they they capture you and put you on the block and the executioner takes an axe and cuts off your head who killed you was it the prime minister or was it the executioner was it the king or the executioner you'd say both okay but the person it depends on what you mean when you say who killed him who made the decree who gave the sentence who, who, who created the circumstance or was it the one who actually did the deed so you could say several people are responsible and i would say it's the same thing with the death of jesus you know yes understood <laughs> thank you okay Mr. Tone. Even your ex, um, what is your take on daniel chapter 10 and verse 13 as it relates to um speaking about michael one of the princes because i know somebody um some people have various ideas and i had i was engaged in a discussion on this sometime in the past i just want to hear your take on it there there, there are several verses in the book of Daniel that refer to Michael and um, different verses will say different things for example in Daniel chapter 12 and verse 1 he's referred to as the great prince that stands for the children of your people and um, in some place in, in that one place he's, he's referred to as one of the princes now you have to understand the the, the word prince in the book of Daniel and in many Old Testament books, it means a ruler, a ruling personage. So you could say that the king is a prince and you could say that the son of the king is a prince in this sense. And the Bible even refers to Satan as a prince in, in, in the context of a ruling personality. So we have, to, we have to think of the meaning of the word prince because Gabriel, would be one of the princes. Michael would be one of the princes. It doesn't mean that they are on equality. It means that in God's system of governance, there are certain what I would call principalities. The, the, they are referred to as the watchers and holy ones. There are different agents or different, different personalities that have a different task. So in the system of government, you have princes or authorities. Greater than the others is the great prince or the chief of the princes or the archangel. So the fact that they are in this sense is referred to as a prince, it has to be modified by the statement that, uh, of what it says about him in the other verses as well. The, the complete picture you get from looking at all the verses together. That's how I would, would respond to that. Thank you. You're welcome. But Brother Michael, I, I see you put on a, a question in the chat. Go ahead. Um, I, I... Uh, yeah, so I was always confused by Revelation chapter 17, verse 11, about how the woman sits on top of seven heads, seven kingdoms. And in this morning's uh, sermon from Brother Daniel, we identified uh, six of them, you know, Egypt, Assyria, Babylon, Persia, the Medo-Persian, Greek, and Roman Empire. And there's much contention and debate about what that seventh head is. But 
I'm even more confused about how it says, um, and there were seven kings, five are fallen and one is, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And the beast that was and is not, even he is the eighth and is of the seven and goeth into perdition. Does that refer to the absolute st sense of godlessness or atheism that you've alluded to earlier? Yeah, when it comes to um, Revelation, uh, when it comes to that aethid, that beast, what I will say is that there is enough there that I can, that we can come to a kind of, what should I say, reasonable to some extent, a, 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 con a conclusion, but I would say that it's difficult or impossible to come to a, an absolute conclusion. Now, I, I would try to explain what I mean, brother, brother Mike. Let me let me bring up a picture here, and um, I I know you're probably familiar with this, but um, let me bring it up anyway to kind of um, highlight the question you asked and try to focus on what I think could be the answer. If you notice, I'm being very cautious in how I'm saying things because I don't like to be absolute when it comes to certain questions. But uh, uh, here, here's a kind of graphic diagram of how I understand it. All right. Now, the beast is that red rectangle, and the woman is represented by that purple triangle on top, sitting on the seven heads. Now, it, it says, it does say that there are five that are fallen. These represent the green circles. One is that represents the red circle, and the one that is not yet come represents the yellow circle. So we see that the beast has seven heads. And presently, the head that is ruling is the red head, depending on when presently is, at the time that the prophecy applies. The prophecy applies at a time when one is and one has not yet come. Now we know that we are going to reach a place in time, maybe we are already there, when you can't say that anymore. You can't say one one is and the other is not yet come. You will be at the place where the other has come. And we will be in head number seven. Maybe we are already there. Based on my understanding of, of the prophecy. I think we are. But anyway. Then it says that the beast is the eighth. Now, the question is the eighth what? The eighth what? It cannot. The beast cannot be the eighth head because there are only seven heads. So when it says the beast is the eighth, it must mean he's the eighth king. There are seven heads, and they represent seven kings, and the beast is the eighth king, not the eighth head. So based on this, I understand that when the beast becomes, when, when the seventh head falls, the beast appears in his true nature. Whatever this, this, this entity has been that has been underlying these seven heads, all these millennia finally appears in his true color. He doesn't have a head, instead he has 10 horns. These 10 horns receive power as kings one hour with the beast. They don't exist while the seven heads are there. They come, they, they, they come into existence, they receive power. When the beast receives power as king number eight, then the 10 horns also receive power. And it is at that time that they will hate the woman and eat her flesh and make her naked and burn her with fire. So the question really is, what is the nature of the beast? Especially when he arises after the seventh head. The Bible says he will arise out of the bottomless pit. He will come from the abyss. This is why I conclude that the beast in his last incarnation is a power that is more devilish than anything that we have ever seen. It will be a government. It will be a system. It will be a kingdom. That does not have any 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 clearly identifiable head, but it, it it's it's in the European area, and it is so evil that it hates religion. It will destroy the woman, and of course it will attack God's people. So it is it is anti-Christianity at the very least. Might be anti-anti-religion. It overthrows Babylon. So the beast from the bottomless pit, in my opinion, is a is a godless system. It's a system that is openly godless, anti-God, 
and we and, and and for me it is alarming that i can look at europe right now and i can see that that system developing I see that in Europe, they are turning the churches into nightclubs. Religion is dying in Europe. You go on the internet and simply look for the most atheistic countries in the world. All of them, almost all of them are in Europe with a couple of exceptions that you wouldn't expect. Canada is one of them. Australia is one of them. The rest of them are in Europe. Massively atheistic. So there, there, there are many Christians who are expecting the world to turn around and become very religious and make a Sunday law and it's going to be one religious body against a religious body but based on what I see here in this prophecy and based on the way I see the world developing I see a different picture altogether I see the world turning to atheism the the the, the dominant force is going to be anti-god when you see them in 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 America kicking the bible like a football this is a reflection of the way people now think about Christianity. It will intensify and grow worse, in my opinion. Yes, Brother I agree. Mike. So I, I agree completely. Um, these trends are undeniable, both in Europe and the United States. But what I have found is simultaneously, there is also a growing, um, with the remaining Christians, a religious fervor in the most uh, absurd error in the dispensations in this obsession with Jerusalem. And, you know, I think our enemy, Lucifer, is very resourceful. You know, I, what is he going to do of making of that? And that's where my theory kind of comes that that seventh head could even possibly be very shortly, very briefly, a period where uh, the second coming is faked and it appears in Jerusalem, but the atheists will not accept it. Um, and you know, there's some compelling evidence outside of the Bible, not in the Bible, that leads me to think that. But I'm following the commands of my Lord, where he said to be as wise as serpents, but as harmless as doves. And, you know, when I look at the woman, Babylon, in, in Revelation 18:24, it says, and in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth, all. And that's strange, because if she's destroyed, and there's this period of absolute atheism. Um, what, what I have it is that God's people have been persecuted under the pretense of religion, right? I think we can agree on that. It's always been the pretense of religion, and that's what uh, the woman has been doing all their time. But after she is destroyed, atheists, I think, would still, like, they hate all religion, all religion including. And I think to get to that point where all religion is thrown out, you know, the the baby with the bathwater, right? The whole, all really, there needs to be some event that seals all atheists to say all religion is total bunk. It has just uh, only misled people. It's been responsible for all the, 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 the crusades, the murders, the wars, the conflicts in the Middle East. We need to get rid of it. So I, I don't know what that event is, but I think it might have something to do with the conflict in the Middle East. Okay. I mean, with some things, I think we can just say, okay. Let's see what happens, you know, interesting ideas, but we just have to wait because some things the Bible is not really settled and very clear. We, 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 we need to pray and ask the Lord to help us to have understanding because we are at that point in time where we need the understanding. But I mean, I would say that it's one of those ideas. You know, somebody was talking to me this week and they were talking about the Sunday laws and he said, well, look here, if Satan appears on this earth as Jesus Christ, everything changes. You know, he was talking about how the evangelicals in America, there's going to be a backlash because of what is going on with the Democrats and that they are going to um, push, the, 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 that the, the, the Republicans and the religious right, they are going to come back into power. It may be. I, I, I don't have the gift of prophecy, but he's saying that Satan is going to appear as Christ on this earth and everybody is going to be converted, okay? Now, if that happens, I fold my hands and I, I, I say, yes, I, 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 but, but at the moment, what I can look at is what I, the, 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 the marks and the indicators that I see in the Bible and in what is happening. Sure, if, if somebody that everybody thinks is Jesus Christ appears doing great miracles and so on, then anything is possible. Even then, 
It will be remarkable to me if the world turns to Christianity. Even then, I heard Richard Dawkins say that if he sees Jesus Christ coming in the clouds, he still wouldn't believe in him because in this age of technological deception and holograms, you can't trust anything. And that's the way a lot of people think. If they see a miracle happen, they'll put it down to a computer trick or something. Anyway. And that's what I think. Yeah, that's what I think as well. So if it was faked, there would be a huge class of atheists who still don't believe it, but the still believing religious world of all, they would. And they would be taken in, you know, kind of like that net to capture all of it. And then they would leave, pave the way for the eighth state of the ten horns where there's no more religion. And, you know, I, I've been fascinated that all of the evangelicals and other American denominations, because we're going to keep in mind the beast with lamb-like horns is also called the false prophet. And when Jerusalem was reestablished after World War II with the, um, you know, after World War II, that was considered, many people were like, wow, this is proof that the Jewish people are chosen of God. But you and I know that in this dispensation, uh, uh, one is a Jew of the circumcision of the heart. It has nothing to do with genealogy. But there are a huge, a huge portion of Christendom in America really does hold to the uh, physical, like the genealogical Israel. And I think something has to be involved with that. But yeah, I apologize. Continue. No problem, Brother Mike. I'm, I'm just about to um, wrap up here now. Brother Ian wants to say something. I'm about to wrap up because... Uh, Can I say the... something after, too? Uh, yes, Brother Ian and then Sister Elizabeth. And then uh, we will go to... Yeah, Brother David, I, I was just looking at the drawing that you had up there. Something just occurred to me. <laughs> Sometimes it, it's amazing how this graphical representation can get your mind thinking in a certain way. And when I looked at how the woman sit, sat on all seven heads, I realized that when all seven heads have fallen, the woman has no way to sit anymore. It's, it's, you know, it just came clear to me that that is when, of course, the ten horns. And I just wanted to highlight and um, point out that the ten horns are always there on the beast. It's just that they just don't have any power until that time. Yeah, because it says that is a it's a beast with seven heads and ten horns. But it's at this particular time when all the heads are fallen, the woman had no way to sit, no more support, that the beast become the eight uh, and through the powers that given to the horns that it attacks the woman and destroy her, destroys her. Or they destroy her, yeah. So um, I just thought that you know it was kind of interesting. Just looking at the graphics, it it brought that clear to my mind. Okay, yeah, man. thanks. For that. That's a good. Thing. Sister Elizabeth, you can go ahead. Brother David, I don't know if you know, but in 2015, uh, the Vatican bought the rights uh, to broadcast Jesus coming through the East Gate in Jerusalem. And so everybody who wants to view this has to buy from them. Because remember, the world will see. But, you know, in, in my head, the East Gate that's closed permanently now, there's graveyards right there. So that means if yeah. Jesus came and walked there, it, it's, it's going to be desecrated. <laughs> you know, it's how how is that possible a holy god but you know it's foolishness but i don't know if you knew that the vatican is involved with flying saucers and and spaceships they're, they're involved in all kind of craziness so it wouldn't be strange either to know that they did that you know but what i think is that you know what we are doing and what we should keep on doing is to look at biblical evidence and try to see what is the most perfect fit um the 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 thing is that there are, there's always room there's always room for different different ideas that we could say possibly this might be possibly this might be there there there, there are so many ways that it could possibly be that the, these prophecies will be fulfilled that is why we have to look strictly at what the bible says and see what we can find that makes the best fit. That's it. And then we can stay there until until the Lord shows us something better. But I, I, I am a firm believer in the best fit. Okay, the best fit. There are some things that we might believe that need adjusting, but we don't see anything better. And if we don't see anything better or that makes more sense, I would say 
we can at least hold on to what we have until the Lord shows us something else. But um, you know, so so I'm just saying this because there are many different possibilities. But if if we present a possibility, we have to have a strong biblical foundation to say it fits the Bible, it fits the, the specifications of what the Bible says better than anything else. All right. So we could bear this in mind as we continue to study. I I for one. I have not stopped asking the Lord to give me better understanding. I have not stopped because I, I, I believe we are in the time. We are in the time. Everybody knows this. We are in the time. The prophecies were written for our time. And, and God knows that when, when we understand these prophecies, he designed it in such a way that when we understand them, it will be, it will be the, the foundation of a great religious revival. It will be. That's what he designed it for. It was not just a book about history and a book of, of fanciful stories about animals and strange beasts. No, there's a purpose that our God has in mind behind these books. And so let us all join together in asking him to give us the insight and the wisdom that we might understand these prophecies properly. The things that are hidden from the wise and prudent, remember, he reveals to babes and sucklings. All right, we're going to um, end at this point. Any further discussion, we'll, we'll take up after we pray.